Oh, I, I'm, I'm not ready. One, one, one second. Oh. Okay. No problem. Yes. Do it. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to APC Phase 3 seminar. Let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Matsataka Watanabe from the White Man. Today, he will talk about the non perturbative correction at large variable number. Please join me welcoming our speaker, Matsataka. Thank you. Yes. Great. So I'm going to talk about non perturbative corrections, a large barrel number or large charge expansion. Uh, I'm from Weizmann Institute of Science, and this is based on work in progress with uh, two of the students there. Let's go. So, so let, let's summarize what, what I'm going to say before I start, uh, you know, for, for someone who's busy. Uh, so I will first show that large charge sector is a solvable limit in our generic CFTs even if they are strongly coupled, including non-Lagrangian CFTs. And uh, one can see that using effective field theories. And I will show an example of this using the O2 Wilson Fisher theory, uh, and uh, we will compute the operator dimension of phi to the Q, uh, where Q is much larger than one uh, complex Wilson Fisher. I will then show you a numerical plot, which our formula fits very well down to Q equals to one. And we will see partially why this is the case, by using double expansion in terms of the epsilon expansion and uh, Q much larger than one. And then finally, we will discuss various non perturbative fractions associated with this double expansion. Okay. So, real introduction. Interactions make physics interesting. The farther one goes away from the field field theory, the more interesting the physics becomes. And strong interactions were also unavoidable in physics because typically at low energies, theories become strongly coupled because of the renormalization flow. However, strongly coupled theories are usually hard to solve because of the lack of perturbative expansion. And one usually needs some other assumption to track them, such as supersymmetry, integrability, duality, etc. Okay, so but what if I tell you that one can still solve such theories without using those extra assumptions? And it's true, strongly coupled theories kind of a limit sector in which it becomes solvable. Uh, but by which I mean, Usually, one, one solves theories by using weak coupling expansion, which means that you have a series of theories which goes to the solvable limit uh, when you tune the parameter. But I'm not talking about this. You have one theory, and you take the sector, uh, the large charge of something, and then it becomes solvable. So, so one example is a se sector of large spin, right? We know from analytic bootstrap, the CFTs become uh, usually generalized free large spin. Another example, which I'm going to discuss today, is a sector of large global charge. And we will see that there is an effective field theory in the inverse charge expansion. Anyway, um, there is also a naive question when I said the sector of large charge, right? Because consider O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point, and you can solve it in the epsilon expansion, and we can compute the dimension of phi to the Q or phi to the N or something. And the result looks like this. So uh, the, the actual coefficients doesn't matter, but what's important here is that it's actually an expansion in terms of epsilon times n, when n is large and epsilon is small. And uh, okay, think about taking n to infinity. The expression is uncontrolled when epsilon is much greater than one because it's actually an expansion in terms of epsilon times n. And uh, just because we wanted epsilon to take epsilon to one in n, there should be the region of uh, epsilon times n much greater than one, greater than one is the region of interest. And uh, so how can we reach it, reach this region? And I will answer all these questions, to the questions to today. And uh, the spoiler is that effective field theory captured the regime where epsilon times n is much greater than one. In the Feynman diagram, if you do it, uh, capture the regime, uh, epsilon times q or n is much less than one. And so let's start from the effective field theory. Oh, by the way, you can ask any questions anytime because what I'm going to tell you is basically very simple. So um, if, you, if you don't understand something, it's my fault for not explaining it properly. All right, so oh, no. let's start from the, am, am I shared still? Oh no. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, turn it off. I, I hit some wrong button. <laughs> Yes. 
Right. Uh, so let's start from the simplest example, simplest one. So, which is D equals to three O two Wilson Fisher fixed point, and uh, it's a it's a strongly coupled theory, and we try to compute something uh, which is phi to the Q, where Q is much greater than one. It's the um, operator dimension of phi to the Q. Let's say you can also compute OP coefficients, blah blah, but uh, let's focus on uh, the UV Lagrangian of this O two Wilson Fisher fixed point is the following. So you have uh, you know you have this five four Lagrangian uh, with a coupling constant is lambda. And lambda is order one in the IR on the IR fixed point. We also tune m squared, so m squared is like like order one. So anyway, even though it's the only example I will talk about today, it'll be clear that our method applies to other large number of theories like the various dimensions, various symmetries, with or without Susie. You can ask me questions again, but it, it, it'll be clear in the end. I hope. Uh, so good, good. We were talking about the O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point in D equals three dimensions. Right, and now that we are considering a CFD, we're considering a CFD, so uh, we can use the state operator correspondence to compute the dimension of phi to the Q. Meaning, uh, if I Q, there, there is this operator phi Q and it corresponds to a state phi to the Q uh, on, on S2 cross R. And we can, we can also use the fact that phi to the Q is the lowest operator at charge Q, because, uh, you know, it's the lowest operator at charge Q. And this corresponds, I mean, this is sort of a definition of part of the Q. This corresponds by using state operator correspondence to the ground state energy, a charge Q, and S2 cross R, because the dimension of phi to the Q is the energy of the state phi to the Q. And just because it's the lowest dimension operator at the sector Q, this must be the lowest energy state at sector Q. I mean, I mean Hilbert space with charge Q. Right? Uh, and it's a state operator correspondence, so we set the radius of S2 to be one. So, so if you find some uh, mismatch in dimensional analysis, it's, it's because we, we set the radius to be one. So, so, so right. Uh, so again, uh, you have S2 and uh, you have time direction, and we were looking for the uh, lowest state, ground state in HQ, meaning, uh, meaning state states with charge Q. Here, charge is uh, what kind of charge in here? Ah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I meant to say O2 charge. O2 charge, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Right, so, <clears throat> so, um, so we want to compute the ground state energy at charge Q. And of course, we can use the ground canonical ensemble in order to do, in order to do it. So how, how do we do it? So grand canonical ensemble is defined like uh, exponential minus beta times uh, H minus mu Q with chemical potential added of, and you take the trace of it on uh, the spatial slice. And uh, by taking the derivative in terms of mu, the chemical potential or the temp inverse temperature, you will get the average charge or the energy. And uh, in particular, you take the lower temperature limit, beta goes to infinity, and uh, just because Z is like uh, beta something plus minus beta something dot dot dot, and they they all go out when you go to beta to infinity, uh, a, you can you, you can define the grand canonical uh, the partition function, uh, yeah, part, uh, grand canonical uh, free energy, sorry, grand canonical free energy, which you you see that at beta goes to infinity is E minus mu Q. Meaning that we need uh, it's it's the Legendre transform of of E of Q. I, I, I mean, so you, you can you evaluate the grand canonical free energy and you get the F as a function of mu, and you Legendre transform to get E as a function of Q. Great. Uh, Right, so, so what's, what's important here is that we can represent the grand, grand canonical partition function using the pass integral and then use a subtle point approximation. So, so um, according to the pass integral formulation, uh, it, it, it's what we want to compute, but if you use the pass integral, uh, you can represent it like uh, you know, action minus mu q uh, integrated over the whole phase space. Um, so this is what you want to compute. And, uh, 
it's just because um, this is the O2, O2 charge density rho. O2 charge density is, uh, you know, you can use Nether theorem to see that this is defined like this, right? Um, so, so the modified Lagrangian, which is like lamp, uh, Lagrangian minus mu Q, um, looks like the following. Um, this plus, okay, let's forget about the uh, mass term because it's not relevant. Uh, uh, minus, I said minus, I guess. Right. It looks something like this. And, uh, you know, this, this contains the term like this. Um, so, so, so what it actually does is to um, modify partial zero to partial zero minus i mu. And um, so, so what I mean is that if we redefine phi to be some rotating field, big phi, which is like exponential minus i mu t times phi, you can, you can re reabsorb this um, uh, background gauge field in the time-like direction to uh, introduce a mass for the phi field negative mass for the phi field. So the Lagrangian looks like this. And uh, uh, so, so, so basically, this looks like a Mexican, poten Mexican half potential with uh, a big phi field. And if uh, you, you can easily use the uh, a subtle point approximation, I mean, subtle point evaluation of the path integral, because at beta goes to infinity, the relevant subtle point is the vacuum configuration of phi. And quite simply, this is big phi is equal to constant because it's a maximum half potential. Uh, and if you, if you go back to the little phi field, it means that phi is equal to something times i mu t. So mu is the potential, yes. Here, is it Euclidean, right? Euclidean. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. I, 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 I think I slightly lied here. Um, well, yeah, yes, you're totally right. What, yeah, what, I, what we should do, actually, so, okay, it, it's, it's, yeah, I, 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 I plan not to t uh, tell you, talk about this, if, if no one noticed, but, yeah, yes, what, so, so right, uh, so what, what we should have done is the following, actually, um, uh, so what we should have done is the following, um, that we go to the, uh, partition function, free, free energy, uh, partition function in the sector Q. So, so we should have inserted the delta function. This goes to uh, the integral over, uh, so I, I, don't, I don't remember the coefficients, but uh, so it roughly looks like this. Uh, but by which I mean, you, you, you use the free transformation in terms of the charge to go to this expression. and. Uh, a theta looks like the uh, chem uh, imaginary chemical potential. Um, so, and if, if you use the path integral uh, formulation of this one, you, you can actually um, use the original action with a twisted boundary condition, which is this. Sorry, I meant to say beta. Uh, here, this phi, if you define the two phi, so which phi here? This phi, little phi, phi, little phi, little phi, little phi, little phi. I see. Little phi has a twisted boundary condition. Okay. Yes. So it's so so if I if I really wanted to be rigorous, I should have done this. And uh, you you have twisted boundary condition with the original action, and uh, so you in the Euclidean direction, and uh, you have beta. Uh, so you look for the lowest energy solution here, and uh, by, by virtue of equation of motion, the lowest energy solution is like uh, helically in time. But uh, I mean, I mean, tau x must be like uh, i tau over beta theta probably of this, and uh, because you you want the lowest energy solution, it be it's better be. Uh, uh, homogeneous in space. And then you uh, finally take the, uh, you know, width, width rotation, and then you will see that the relevant subtle point is this. 
so so that's what should have what, what I should have said. But uh, you know, I need to go to Lawrence and to Euclidean, and then back to Lawrence. And so I, I I didn't like to do it. That's why I didn't do it. But so uh, so right. So after all, all the complications aside, and uh, but uh, all the complications I said already. But uh, let us. Okay, what we have to do is clear enough, right? Uh, we find a lower saddle point configuration of the original Lagrangian, this Lagrangian, which has the dependence uh, phi is equal to a times exponential i mu t on s2 cross r. And to compute the energy of the configuration um, in terms of the chemical potential, and then you perform the Lagrange Legendre transform to get um, the energy as a function of the charge. Uh, and uh, this is nothing but the dimension of the operator. And uh, we, we, although we use the subtle point approximation at large Q, the action evaluated the subtle point becomes large. So the subtle point analysis is therefore controlled. So Meaning here, the time, Euclidean time is R or part of the S or, so here, you said you mentioned that you, or <laughs> you did just already go to the Laurentian or? I, I already went to the Laurentian ah, uh, because it's the same thing. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, right, right, right. Right, so I, I told you that, uh, so we can use the subtle point approximation, subtle point is controlled, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we can go on and actually compute the classical action and the one loop abstractions and so on and so on. If it were a weakly coupled theory. And in fact, once we do this in the epsilon expansion, where lambda is a border epsilon, we will get back to this later on. But in the absence of such a weak coupling parameter, we can just use the effective field theory around the subtle point. So it's a strongly coupled theory. We don't know what the R is, but we know the symmetry breaking pattern of the theory. So we can use the effective field theory around the subtle point. And the writing effective field theory is all about the symmetry breaking pattern, as I already said, and the massless modes created by this. Um, so because just because we can use the original action with the twisted boundary condition to do this, the addition of the chemical potential can be transmuted to the boundary condition of the partition function, which mean, which I mean again, the helical dependence of the configuration. So, so but uh, I, even though I introduced the chemical potential, it actually, um, um, you can think about it as an explicit breaking, but you can also think about, think about it as a spontaneous symmetry breaking. And this is, this has its advantage. It's not just different views, but it is kind of advantage towards uh, physics. Great. So now we decided to write down the effective field theory of our action, original action, around the subtle point, which looks like helical in time. Right. So the symmetry of the underlying theory is conformal invariance because we were talking about CFT and the global symmetry O2. Uh, by spontaneous symmetry breaking from, uh, by, by having this one, there appears one number Goldson boson, which is chi. Uh, chi meaning, meaning the angular field. So I define phi to be A times exponential I chi. Chi is the number Goldson boson of the O2 breaking. Um, other symmetry also gets broken, but there is still one number Goldstone boson here. Um, you can also uh, you can see this by using a systematic algorithmically see this by using uh, Coleman whatever 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 make a you know C C C W Z formalism C C W Z. I think Coleman someone this Mino. I'm sorry for the other C. Uh, Anyway, what, what, what's, what's weird is that it's not, it's not the number of broken symmetry does not match the number of number Goldstein bosons, but it's okay because the remaining symmetry contains like uh, the time translation plus uh, rota rotation around the O2, uh, which is why something weird is happening. You, 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 you see, uh, because it's exponential i mu t. So if you, if you, um, if you act with time translation t0 on the, you know, bring it back with O2, O2, uh, O2 rotation, the, this configuration does not change. So anyway, so this is why something weird is happening. So uh, it's, it's a little, little, little bit of complication, but 
we just have O2, symmetry broken into nothing. Anyway, what, what we need to do is write down the action invariant on the conformal and the O2 symmetry. And available fields are the number Goldstein boson and the dilaton A. I will call it A because phi is equal to A times exponential I. So A becomes massive because uh, just because we break the symmetry in a weird way. I mean, we break conformal symmetry uh, in relation to the O2 breaking, and then dilaton becomes massive. And we can package everything into one complex field, which is A times exponential I pi. After all, and we just need neutral dimension three operator because it's just effective, effective action. And at leading order, the effective Lagrangian, for example, is the kinetic term plus phi to the sixth because phi has dimension one. So no, dimension of half, I'm sorry. And this is dimension three, and this is dimension three, and uh, this is the only thing you can write down at leading order. Um, if you can do it more systematically, we can integrate out the dilaton and write everything in terms of the number goes symbol. <coughs> Sorry. And I will just now give you the result. So, it, which is this. Um, so you use chi, which is the number goes symbol boson. The O2 symmetry, it acts like chi goes to chi, chi, chi plus C. So you can only use partial, partial mu, partial, partial chi. Um, and uh, you, what you need to do is write down all the dimension three operators. And uh, because chi is like mu t, in, uh, the, uh, it, you can package everything in terms of mu scaling. Uh, also by partial chi, I mean, this is the, <coughs> this is this. Uh, the, the reason why we have some fractional power uh, in the effective action is that it's because of mass of the, mass of the dilaton, which is a, uh, a mass of the a, this scales like mu. So this can appear in the den denominator. It's the same as the, let's say, number go to, uh, sorry, number go to action, where you have polyakov action, and then you integrate, integrate out some fields and you get square root of action, square root action. So square root is not a problem here because we're not supposed to use it around partial chi near zero. You expand around the uh, the some some vacuum, and then you will get the ordinary type of effective action. Anyway, the ground state energy is the dimension of the operator phi to the q of this Lagrangian. <coughs> so so see uh, so the the vet of chi was mu t, and mu, we took mu to be large. In reality, it's mu times r, but that we set r to be one, so forget about it. Uh, this scales like mu to the cube. And this so means by the that way, this type of the action does it like a well defined? Like a, if you analyze this uh, like a Hilbert space, uh, the yes, uh, the, yeah. So so is it okay? Like uh, it's just yeah. Usually this number of two action is okay, but uh, in arbitrary like a higher like a power of the interaction does it. That's a, I think, very good question. Uh, it's, it's actually okay because you can expand around. Ex, so expand, ex, you, you just need to expand around chi zero plus chi, like, like this, chi fluctuation. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so around uh, chi zero, yeah. it's well defined. Uh -huh. I see. So you can also calculate the set of points uh, which is the chi is mu t, is the set of? Yes, yes. Oh. So you can write down the effect, uh, equation of motion from this, and then you know what the classical uh, solutions are. But and do you now need to uh, expand around such a such a uh, such a vacuum? And then only after then you will have the uh, proper properly defined Hilbert spaces. Right. right. Question. Yes. I think I missed some. Party. So, can I see the on page back, please? Yes. So, so I'm sorry, I I missed the story. And how can you obtain this effective field theory from the previous mm -hmm. standard people theory? Sorry. Ah, uh, 
Right, 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 right. Great, 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 great. So we 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 have this UV Lagrange, yeah. Yes. And we were meant to expand around pi is equal to exponential. Uh, sorry, a a times i mu t. Yes. Um. So so you can, you can even forget about it. Um. Be, just because this breaks the symmetry from O two to nothing. Um, there's one number Goldstein votes on that's relevant for the effective field theory. Yes. So in order to write down the effective field theory, one just needs to write down the, um, the effective field theory, uh, effective action, which is metric uh, under all the symmetries of the original action. Yes, right. So, so maybe, maybe please forget about it, uh, but you, uh, for, for example, um, here, because mu is the largest parameter in the system, um, the, uh, the dimension three operator, and which has the biggest scaling in terms of mu, is this, uh, this operator, right? Uh, partial mu chi, partial mu chi goes like mu squared, just, yes. just because it contains partial zero chi. Um, and uh, it, it needs to be dimension three. So you need this, and it goes this. It goes mu squared, mu cubed, I'm sorry. And it's the largest contribution, right? If you add derivatives to it, um, it suppresses the uh, mu scaling. So you can see that it's the largest effective operator that we can use to construct the effective action. I see. Mm. So how can I? derive this in a systematic way? <laughs> uh, you mean like uh, solving RG equations or what, something yeah, like that? Yeah. Hey, what can actually do it? Um, I, I forgot how to do it. Uh, I, I forgot how to do it. Um, uh, Something like this. Um, no, th 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 uh, there is there is a very intuitive argument for the, for this. Um, uh, I'll try to remember it until the end of the talk. And if I couldn't remember it, uh, there is a there, there is one section devoted to this in 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 in, in the paper. So so okay. I will I will refer to you. Uh, okay, I see. When I, I could remember it, when I can't remember. Okay, yeah, thank you. Great, great, thank you. <laughs> great. Great, so, so right. Uh, right. Right, 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 right. So, so we were talking about this effective action using the number ghost and both, huh? Uh, right, right, right. So, so. I, I didn't tell you how to how to how to derive this, but uh, I, I already told you that this is leading order, and uh, I, I think I convinced you. Uh, this is a second order, uh, leading, next leading order one, and then there are no corrections uh, until order q to the minus one. I mean mu to the yeah. So so let's let's see. The first terms is all, is of order mu to the q. We can use the Nether theorem to say mu is order. Uh, uh, square root of q. So, so uh, I'll probably do it. Uh, so, so by, by, by virtue of Noether theorem, it's like um, a row is this. It's a Noether theorem. And then this means that, you, you know, simply because so, so it's roughly a partial mu chi to the square meaning it's mu square. So, so the charge density is proportional to mu square. So when you take mu to be large, Q gets large, but there is a fixed ratio. Q, uh, a mu scales like square root of Q. Meaning the, the scaling of the first term is of order Q to the three halves. The second one, just because it scales like mu, it scales like q to the square root of q. Uh, and dot, dot, dot. Q is the charge of the O2, right? And it's only scaling variant 
Uh, this term is only scale invariant, but not while invariant. Uh, but we'll complete this, uh, complete this term with uh, some while completion. But the completion is lower order in one over Q scaling, so we forget about it. OK. Uh, as, as I told you, uh, this is meant to be used around the vacuum. Chi 0 is equal to mu t. So the singularity of the origin is not a problem. And uh, it's important that there is, there, are, there is literally no term available at order order one. And this is going to be important later. I mean, even if you want to write down, write down a, a term of order one just using chi, you can't do it. So that's, that's going to be very important. Actually, one question more, maybe related to this point. Can I have a local expression in a Polyakov type fashion, as you mentioned before? Uh, so Polyakov type action is, I, I guess, this one. Oh, this one. Sort of. But, but yeah, no, I mean, it's not really true. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not really true. Um, I don't think it's possible to get the Polyakov type action just because, you know, the problem of the singularity, I mean, I mean, it might be possible. Uh, I don't know how to say this. Yeah, usually non-local yeah, non form can be localized to the interaction of some type of additional mysterious type of fields or blah, blah, something, you know, yeah. I should probably say that the uh, Polyakov action was the, the original action, like uh, pi four action, right? And yeah. then I, I specialized to phi large to get the, you know, this, and integrated out the radial mode to get this action. But radial mode would be kept. It's weird to generate such a non-analytic term. Because uh, radial mode is massive, I think. I think this is a very good question. Um, so I'll, ex I'll explain. Um, so, so, right, right. You're, you're right. You're right. Y yes. Um, usually, usually, it's, so for example, in Carroll perturbation theory, um, you, you have some parameter because of symmetry breaking. You know, you set the bev to something. So you can use the bev. Uh, the 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 web v so this is dimension four i can use it to um construct the in a effective field theory and the uh, the usually you, you can use derivative derivative scaling right um if you have more derivatives it gets smaller right uh yeah this in this case it's different the web is fixed by mu uh, is is mu like chemical potential and partial goes like mu because partial mu, uh, partial zero chi is mu. So it's not the, the ordinary derivative scaling. If you have more and more derivatives, um, uh, you, it's not advantageous for the scaling. And this is what makes it a slightly different from the ordinary chiral perturbation theory. And that you answer your question, um, so, so you, you you, you have term like this in the chiral perturbation theory, right? Right, um, something like this. Yes, right. But V, V in this case, because there is no scale in the original safety, V is like partial chi. At leading order, it can be, a, a I mean, it, it, it must be, so the, the, the web itself must be associated with the, with the operator itself. And then it's a, a leading order. What, what this operator is, is partial chi. This is why partial chi can appear in the denominator. In other words, the radio, mass of the radial mode is partial chi itself. This is why partial chi can appear in the denominator. And um, there's nothing else for us to do, uh, for us that we can do, because there are no scale in the system, intrinsic scale in the system. I see. Okay. Mm. I, I think it's very important. Yes, yes. I see. Let me consider this more. I, I see. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, thank you. But yeah, yeah, but, but, but it's exactly the idea of like uh, say, same as effective uh, string, idea of effective string. Uh, you, you use number goes to uh, number go to auction, but uh, that's what's happening here as well. Uh, right, right, right. So, so yeah, and I, and I think it's important too. So uh, I'll talk to you about the difference between this effective field theory and the other effective field theory uh, people use in order to study the system. So we've been treating the O2 model and wrote the effective field theory for original action, a large charge, using the field chi. And people actually have considered writing down the effective field theory with large chemical potential for the action with chemical potential term added. So you think about chemical potential term to be an explicit break-in and then write down the effective field theory. And this is less advantageous because it has less symmetries. And in particular, conformal or Lorentz symmetry is broken. So effective action can, can only, only be this, right? You, you, you gotta treat a time direction and space direction to be different. So, but you can use the underlying conformal invariance and its water density, which means a trace of T is zero. And this dictates that uh, the speed of sound is one over square root of two. This is one over two. Uh, using, our, using our effective field theory, this can easily be derived by setting chi is equal to mu t plus chi fluctuation. So you, you have chi to the cube, and uh, this contains a term like uh, fluctuation plus this term. So, so th this is more, uh, this is much easier because th th there you, have, you cannot use just the ordinary derivative expansion. But we, we, can, we can tweak it around to write down the much simpler effective action if we notice that mu can appear in the denominator and mu is nothing but the a partial cut. So the Lorentz symmetry just here uh, in the effective field theory is spontaneous, kind of spontaneous broken by the background. Yes, yes, you can think about it that way. Uh, I... But but I you already saw it because you know you, you can have chemical potential. Yes, uh, and and we usually think that it breaks the you know symmetry explicitly. Um, but again, you can you can change it to um, this, where it didn't really break the symmetry because this simply looks like this. Sorry, I meant to say that. Whoa. And this does not break any symmetry explicitly. Okay. So even if it breaks the Lorentz symmetry, uh, I mean. If, if you combine the O2 symmetry and the Lorentz symmetry, uh, there is some combination, uh, which is good. Yeah, so, so that's that. Uh, in other words, you have ward, still ward identity. Right, so, we, right, right, right. We wrote down the effective field theory like this. Our subtle point is chi zero is equal to mu t and mu still like square root of q. So the classical contribution to the ground state energy is simply something to q to the three halves and something to square root of q plus dot dot dot. And we can go on and compute loop corrections to this. And the loop correction is suppressed as the action itself is large at the subtle point, which is like q to the three halves. So it's much larger than one. Uh, right, so, so you can compute the one loop correction. The one loop correction is the order of one, uh, right? It just, it just because it's locked there. Since there are no effective operator there, the prediction gives a precise prediction as a number, not as an undetermined coefficient in the EFT. So these are undetermined coefficients in the EFT because we use the Wilsonian action, so we couldn't determine it. But the order one part, uh, there, there are no counter terms available, and then it gives a precise prediction. So we can do it by, by expanding in terms of chi is equal to mu t plus chi fluctuation, and it contains a term of term like this. But uh, so, so this again tells you that the speed of the number goes on, boson is one over square root of two, not 
one in the ordinary, like like in the ordinary system, ordinary like uh, symmetry breaking. Uh, this is a consequence of again Lorentz symmetry breaking. However, the, the speed is fixed by the underlying conformal symmetry, meaning you can use the water identity to fix it. But yeah, but uh, yeah, there is water identity, so you can also view it as spontaneous symmetry breaking. Great, so let's compute it. I mean, there, there, there's, there's nothing to do anymore. So this is the um, one loop correction term. Uh, I mean, one loop correction comes from this term, and then you use log depth. And the log depth can be decomposed into spherical harmonics. Uh, this is multiplicity. This is the energy of the angular moment, momentum L energy. And then you sum it up, sum it up. And then you need to use zeta function to regularize and renormalize to get this number. It's a number, and uh, <clears throat> it'll come into the uh, final result. And two loop is even more suppressed and starts at q to the minus three halves and so on. Great. So we use our effective field theory like this, and we, we summed up loop corrections. And our final result for the ground state energy, hence the operator dimension of part of the q, becomes this, some unknown coefficient times q to the three halves plus some unknown coefficients times square root of q minus 0 0.094 plus smaller corrections. And these are to be determined using weak coupling expansion with numerical simulations or other inputs. But there is no way for us to determine it at the moment. So it's a bit surprising, right? Um, the dimension of part of the q, um, we usually use free theory intuition or Susie intuition and say it must scale like Q, but it, it doesn't. If it, if it breaks the super symmetry, it goes that much, that high up. It, right, so, so it's a remark, but the, um, the only assumption we use is a symmetry breaking pattern, O2 to nothing. So the, the effective field theory is all the same for other theories, but this, O2 to nothing symmetry breaking pattern. Of course, with different C, you know, these unknown Wilsonian coefficients, but the same minus 0 0.094 at the O1, order one. So if you have such, an, uh, such, a, such a theory and you compute the uh, operator dimension at charge Q, you would see this behavior. And there are actually an infinite number of such examples, which is the CPN minus one model, large monopole number. And we call this so. So if you if you compute the dimension of the large monopole operator, uh, at monopole number Q, you will see this and uh, exactly this 0 0.094. Uh, uh, people actually computed it uh, at large n and then uh, verify this prediction. We call this a large charge universality class with multiple different theories behaving in the same way at large charge. Great. So I'll show you a little numerics. Uh, we can also compare this with Monte, Monte Carlo simulations, and the uh, people computed the lowest upper dimension of fixed charges up to Q equals to 10. You see how the formula fits well. The result suggests a remarkable fit, even down to Q equals 1, because it's a Monte Carlo data. And uh, they fit it with this function, and then it uh, somehow goes down to Q equals 1. And it's surprising, but it's a numerical uh, mystery. Uh, right. I guess I have 15 more minutes. Uh, I, I, yeah, great. So this result is weird though, right? Why is the operator dimension of the Q again not proportional to Q? If you use Feynman diagrams, we get Q plus corrections. In particular, at equal to four, the Wilson Fisher fixed point is a free theory. So if we do the same analysis, effective field theory analysis in the equals to four, we would have gotten Q to the four thirds because it's the semi-classical result. Uh, meaning, meaning Hamiltonian density, energy density, it's that's just dimensional analysis, proportional to uh, charge density to the two, two, uh, three over uh, two, uh, three halves. That's the, the equal to three. So in the equals to four, you would have gotten this. And not, 
delta q is equal to q. So there's some something I'm lying, lying, lying. You know, when when I said we use effective field theory. Um, so in general, it's d over d minus one for general d. But they're not there because imagine computing this using Feynman diagrams. Let's say we have the weak coupling parameter g, right? G is a strength of two body interactions between two particles. And uh, we're computing the energy of two Q particle systems, yeah? And again, and, and the uh, g to the k minus one correction to the leading order result comes from k body interactions between them. But the way a pair of k particles up inside a total of Q particles is Q to choose k. So it's, it's about Q to the K. So in total, the correction would go as G times Q to the K over G. So this means that the actual expansion parameter is G times Q. So Feynman diagram computation can only capture the regime where GQ is much less than one because that's where it's actually uh, valid. While our effective field theory captured the regime, GQ is much greater than one. And indeed, the Feynman diagram computation shows nicely the expansion in terms of epsilon times q. And we can explicitly compute and show this if we go back to our grand canonical ensemble. If you remember our grand canonical ensemble, we could have evaluated using weak coupling expansion the saddle point and then compute it around in you know, saddle point like this. And uh, we can compute the, uh, we can, we, we, we had no weak coupling parameter, so we had no way of knowing what A was, and then we had to use effective field theory. But because we have the weak coupling parameter epsilon, we can compute A and compute the energy of the configuration. So let's do this. It's going to be complicated, a little. Uh, so, so we're looking for the lowest configuration, like helical configuration in the epsilon expansion. The Lagrangian was the original Lagrangian, where lambda is of order epsilon. And then is the conformal coupling. And so and lambda is epsilon, I mean the coupling constant in the uh, at the infrared fixed form. Okay. You can use the effect, uh, equation of motion on the charge fixing constraint. Uh, and, and you can get mu and a is a function of q. Meaning this is the equation of motion, and this is the charge fixing constraint. And then you, 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 you know, you can, you get the set of equations like this. And if you plug in a squared to this one, you can see that it's a cubic equation. So there is an analytic solution for mu. And then you, because you know the energy in terms of mu, you can plug it in to get the energy analytically, at, at least at leading order. So, uh, we were trying to solve for the subtle point of the action uh, of the of the helical form, and then we reduced it, reduced the problem to uh, two equations, couple of equations. And we can solve this analytically, but let's first understand this qualitatively because there are two simplifying limits. Um, so you have this term, you have this term, and uh, there is a competition between two terms. So there are two simplifying limits where this term is much greater than the, the other, this one, or the, um, the other term is much bigger than this one. Meaning, meaning it's the, uh, it basically is when this wins, it's a free limit. When this wins, it's the interacting limit. So in the interacting limit, for example, mu is much greater than, greater than m. And then this means that a squared, uh, is like uh, proportional to mu squared and q goes like mu q. So, so energy properly looks like lambda times q to the three, uh, four over three. And this limit becomes lambda q much greater than one. It, it, I think it's complicated, but uh, it, it's the computation. It, it's what you can do. But it, it's, it's important that it, uh, even though we, we use the um, epsilon expansion, it, it um, reproduces the scaling like four over three, uh, like which is the. So I told you that the delta Q go like goes like uh, four over three and equals to four. It it equals, uh, yeah. Effective field theory. Uh, so in the free limit, 
um, mu is all of order like order one, and then a goes like square root of q. It's almost free action, so energy looks like proportional to q as expected. So it's very important that we have formal coupling that these two terms compete, and uh, we can think about these two limits. Anyway, anyway, if we do this more systematically, we get the following classical energy of the subtle form. So when epsilon times q is much greater, less than one, or epsilon times q is much greater than one, we get this Feynman diagram type uh, result, and we get this effective field theory type result, uh, meaning there is this weird scaling here, meaning uh, indicating that it's a semi-classical uh, result, and uh, it's the uh, it, it's proportional to q, so it's the Feynman diagram type result. And uh, there is a crossover around epsilon times q uh, is around one. And this is not a phase transition because there is a continuous solution for a and mu, hence for epsilon uh, energy in terms of mu. And uh, this kind of explains what happens when the number of particles gets larger in the inverse coupling, meaning uh, you have q and you have inverse coupling, one or epsilon, and uh, you have delta q. So up to here, it scales like uh, linearly a Feynman diagram. It follows the Feynman diagram computation, but above one over epsilon, uh, it goes like effective field theory. So, so, so that's it. But anyway, it's, it's kind of a reason why, I mean, it's not really a reason, but why effective field theory analysis um, was okay down to q plus one because if one of epsilon is order one when you take epsilon to one but it's not really the reason but it kind of intuitively explains why this is the case anyway so let's analyze the free limit first the classical contribution i showed you was this and you can compute the volume computation usually using the usual log depth and it looks like this uh, the final result of the one loop becomes this and this actually matches the Feynman diagram computation down to q equals one. So if you plug in q equals one, this matches the Feynman diagram computation. Now this is slightly surprising uh, because this means that there are probably no uh, no um, no weird corrections. Uh, and uh, is there any non-perturbative corrections that, that are not captured by Feynman diagram computations? I hope we'll get to this today, but uh, I have five minutes, so I'm not sure about. Okay, so now the interactive limit, the classical contribution I showed you was this uh, semi-classical scaling like this, plus a uh, log dead corrections like this. So the final result after one loop becomes this uh, four over three plus uh, times one plus something, something epsilon times log epsilon Q dot dot dot. And the appearance of epsilon times log epsilon Q is very peculiar, right? Because when Q is much greater than one over epsilon times exponential one, one over epsilon, this can be get much larger, bigger than one. I, I mean, I, I'm saying that this can be much larger than one in some regime that we're interested in. Uh, it's, it's okay, it's okay. We just need to use an input from the effective field theory because effective field theory essentially semi, is essentially semi-classical and we expect it delta to go like d over d minus one. Meaning in the epsilon expansion, it should go like four over epsilon, uh, four minus epsilon over three over epsilon, three minus epsilon. And if you expand it in terms of epsilon, you will get this four over three, oh no, one plus this term. So this much matches the, um, expectation from the effective field theory. So if we had resumed it up to infinite loop, we would have gotten this scaling. So we resumed the whole series of modified exponent. The final result is uh, like uh, consistent with effective field theory, meaning uh, you have this um, exponent, which, is, which we expected from the effective field theory um, dot, dot, dot. Um, this is the correction in uh, like a, a epsilon expansion. So basically, we computed the uh, unknown coefficient using epsilon expansion. 
So it's the final result. Uh, the weak, uh, weak coupling, meaning epsilon times Q, much less than one. It looked like Feynman diagram, while epsilon Q much greater than one, it looked like effective field theory. And that's the final result. Uh, right. So the general structure can be packaged into a double scaling unit where X is equal to epsilon times Q fixed, uh, like this. And uh, if, if zero of X is, a, is some smooth function, but it is two behavior when X is much greater than one and X is much less than one. It's the structure of the weak coupling expansion. Uh, so, so even though it was a weak coupling, by taking the number of particles, Q large, we were able to probe the strongly coupled region, meaning D equals to three Wilson Fisher fixed point. Uh, this is actually similar to the ordinary proof limit. And uh, it's kind of similar to the Horvitz Polchinski solution of self gravitating, gravitating strings, because even when the string coupling is small, having a large number of fundamental strings changes the physics, physics qualitatively. So uh, there is some analogy here I want to pursue in, in the future. Yes, so I, I guess I have about three minutes. Um, yeah, how should I proceed? Yeah, right. So I, I wanted to talk about this various non perturbative fractions. And uh, this time I was interested in the free limit, meaning epsilon times Q is much less than one. You have Feynman diagram computation, but are there any non perturbative, non -perturbative fractions which cannot be captured by Feynman diagrams? And I don't know. Um, I, I don't think people know that if there are any non perturbative fractions, to the epsilon expansion. Resurgence people, I don't think, know, or I, I think I have an impression that people believe that there aren't in this case. Uh, I'm not sure if my impression is correct. Anyway, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to answer this question, but let's deal with a case where we're sure that there is such a, such a correction, meaning the OG model in four plus epsilon dimensions, meaning, uh, so meaning lambda is negative. So um, the potential looks like the uh, M squared, Phi squared minus lambda, minus epsilon to the phi to the fourth. So you have vacuum here, but it can tunnel away to infinity. So it's it's a it's a non-unitary system, and that you expect um, some imaginary path for the uh, coupling. Uh, sorry, I'm going to say imaginary path for the upper dimension and so on. Anyway, to get to the four plus epsilon dimension, just uh, replace epsilon with minus epsilon from the previous result, and you get this one. And this, of course, matches the Feynman diagram computation. But, but because again, it's a complex CFT, the upper dimension gets corrected and obtain non-perturbative imaginary paths from instant on fractions. So you see, you can tunnel it away. So it's, it's why you get non-perturbative non fractions. And this was studied by John B. et al. for the ON model at large end. Uh, so this, I'm, I'm going to explain. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, in, in this case, in the interacting limit, the imaginary part is no longer non and uh, because you can replace epsilon with minus epsilon in this regime as well, you will get very big imaginary part. Uh, because it went like, uh, delta was like epsilon Q times something, so surprisingly, when epsilon goes to minus epsilon, it gets an imaginary part. So, so yeah, that's it. Uh, right, right, right. So mm, I, I think I will just show you the result. But ba basically, what, what I'm going to tell what I was going to tell you was the following. Um, you again go back to the grand canonical partition function. And uh, I was only looking for the static solution, but one can also look for the instanton-like solution, which corrects the grounds of the energy. And in this case, the big, since in this case, um, the equation of motion reduces to for the radial mode, uh, something like this with the, uh, the you know the ordinary you know, equation of motion with potential like this and lambda. Uh, this phi four term is a negative, and this looks like. The, the potential looks like this. And we were looking at this one, this is a static solution, but it can tunnel it away. Tunnel away. So uh, there's a solution like this, which is a bound solution, which corrects it uh, and gives you the imaginary non-perturbative part. 
Um, so, so details doesn't matter. Um, but the detail doesn't matter, but all in all, you will get the correction of the form. So at, at, at exponential minus moderate epsilon times F of epsilon times Q. And uh, <clears throat> F of epsilon times Q looks like this. And what's really funny is that the instant action goes to zero at some value of epsilon times Q. Just because um, our potential looked like this, but when, when epsilon times Q is of order one, it starts not having any uh, subtle, uh, any minimum. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so this is the final result. I, I meant to say that uh, what I meant to say that used by uh, using large size expansion, uh, you can get the operate dimension of the four plus epsilon, which is also Fisher fixed point uh, up to here. But by computing the instant on type corrections, you can also compute the one over uh, ex exponential minus one over epsilon times correction as well. So as we approach epsilon times Q is X zero, some threshold, the non-perturbative non imaginary correction gets bigger and bigger. And this connects nicely to the formula for epsilon Q much greater than one because this big non uh, imaginary part cannot be explained if if we didn't have this term, right? Um, you can you, okay. You, you have two type two expressions from above and below. Uh, from above, you can you know you uh, you can approach the you can approach x zero from above. You can also approach x zero from below. Uh, but I don't think you can, uh, these would have matched if we forget about this uh, imaginary non perturbative corrections. And when you approach epsilon times Q to be, uh, goes to the threshold, then match nicely just because we, we have this term. Uh, and we can say that this non perturbative imaginary part comes from the proliferation of the instanton. And this is one step towards understanding why Feynman diagram computation uh, gives you, I mean, this, uh, so, so let's say we just knew the Feynman diagram result and we couldn't have guessed this scaling exponent. And uh, maybe it's one step towards understanding how, what kind of non-perturbative non effect gives rise to this, uh, you know, the weird scaling uh, without using effective field theory. And this concludes what I wanted to say today. Uh, me, so the take home message is that a sector large charge in a CFT is generally semi-classical and one can compute physical quantities in one of the Q expansion by using effective field theory, large chemical potential. When the CFT additionally has a weak coupling parameter, there is a nice double scaling limit where G times Q is fixed. And when G times Q is small, the theory looks perturbative. And when G, to, G times Q is large, it reproduces the result of the effective field theory, um, meaning it looks a little uh, strongly coupled, even though we're in the perturbative, perturbative regime. We computed a non perturbative correction to the formula to see the connection between the results in these two regimes. And the future direction would be understanding the resurgence structure of, the, of this double scaling limit, because how does this relate to the expansion with fixed epsilon and large Q or fixed Q and large epsilon? So, sorry, small epsilon. A similar structure with double, double expansion in twisted superpotential in N equals two gauge theory, right? Because this language um, epsilon times Q much greater than that, greater than one is the electric description. And epsilon times Q much less than one would be the dionic description. So maybe there is some zyber witting curve for this Monsusi model that'll be exciting, but I, you know, it's a, it's a far-fetched train, but it'd be exciting. Uh, also, what can we say about D equals to four minus epsilon? Because we, I don't think people know if there are corrections, non-perturbative non corrections. Uh, but we expect no real bounds because the potential I showed you like this, uh, just be, because, you know, after the fourth term is positive, it doesn't look like, like, like this. There is only one minimum of potential. So there, we expect no instant bound corrections. But so does this mean that we have no, no is this a proof that there are no non-perturbative fractions with the epsilon expansion of the O2 model. 
or we, we might have complex bounces. So um, you can go on to the complex phase space and uh, which I, I don't know if it's justified or not. Uh, so we, we gotta you know, carefully look at lift shift symbol or whatever, but if this contribute as a small non-perfect correction to the epsilon expansion, it'll be amazing, but I don't know the result uh, answer to it, but that's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for exceeding the time. Yes. I'm sorry for exceeding the time. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, is there a question? I, I have, so may I ask some several questions? So as far as I understand, your EFT analysis is basically weak coupling analysis. So generally- No, the Q theory is in a strongly coupled region. So, so generally, given field theory, you introduce some, some S1 circle for time direction that you introduce twist boundary condition, and uh -huh. you consider some new saddle point analysis, then you perturb, you perform perturbative calculation along that new saddle. That's what I want to say. And my question hmm. is how, maybe this question is not well defined, how such a calculation can detect the instant correction from a normal saddle point? Yeah. I see, I see, I see, I see. Oh, I see. Ah, I see. Yeah, here instanton is just from normal instanton between normal settles, but new settles with the twisted boundary condition. You claim your result showed that yeah, you can see, hey, you can see yeah. I might be misunderstanding the question, but the, okay. Uh -huh. So, so uh, th this type of twisted boundary condition, you can you can always rewind it to the normal boundary condition. I, I mean, by by redefining it, you know, new t. Yes. Uh, and, I, and I was just focusing on this uh, phi, and uh, I, when, when I wrote the potential like this, I meant to say uh, r, uh, the potential of r, the radial mode. And then in, in computing a grand canonical partition function, I was trying to say that you, you take this one as, as the lowest subtle point, but you have this type of bounce, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I, I might have misunderstood your question, but I, I, I thought you asked me, how can effective field theory capture this bound solution? Uh, I don't have an answer to it. I, I don't think there is a way to do it. Because just because it's the regime where epsilon times Q is much less than one. But effective field theory captures the regime where epsilon Q is much less greater than one. And then there, there is no, no bound solution because by, when, when epsilon Q is much too big, the potential looks like this. There are no subtle points. That's why the subtle moves away to the complex, complex plane. And this is what gives you the uh, complex imaginary part of the operator dimension. And I might have misunderstood your question. No, I, th I, think, I, I think you answer, you're answering my question precisely. Very, very, very. Uh, mm. uh, uh, and also, I mean, uh, so, so I said in the EQC, we expand around this type of solution and I didn't tell you anything about the bounds. I mean, if there is one, even if there is one, there would be one. I, I don't know if there is any way to capture it. I, I've never thought about it. I, I need to think about it. Like, I guess you're saying that, uh, you know, so, so let, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. So, so, I, so let's, let's say I want to just use effective field theory, but, and I have, I, I was looking for this solution. And what if I found two solutions, A plus and A minus with the same energy? So, so the potential looks like this, let's say in terms of A. So there must be some instant on correction to the formula. But I told you that I expand around this one. So I, I mean, I, I wrote the effect field theory choosing some something and then 
wrote the effective field theory around one particular semi-classical vacuole. Um, does, does it capture this instant on correction? I don't know. I, I don't think so. And, but, and I've never thought about it. But, you're, but you showed that changing epsilon and your result, I mean, seems to mimic instant on corrections. Yes, 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 so, it is. So that, uh, that. I guess I was saying that if I want to say everything in terms of effective field theory, we might be missing some of the corrections, non perturbative, non -perturbative corrections. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm missing. So, so your effective field theory approach can describe, can calculate non perturbative corrections for the scaling dimension. With a large Q. Uh, that seems to include instant corrections in the normal oh, saddle. That's my understanding. So the, the question is how can I understand your yeah, interpretation? Yeah. Ah, I, I see. That, that is true. That is true. Yeah. yeah. When I said non perturbative, I meant to say like uh, one over Q expansion or something. But yes, in the normal sense, this Q to the three halves contains all the non perturbative. Yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I don't know the answer to it in the four minus epsilon case, but I slightly know the answer to it in the four plus epsilon case, because, because just because we have the imaginary part here, which becomes larger and larger to give you this term in the, uh, which was expected from effective field theory. Yeah, but I, 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 I noticed the result itself as you mm. explained it. The question is, how can I, I mean, so in this respect, I'm saying this question is not very fine. So how can I understand? I, I don't know what it means to understand here. So it, it's, uh, yeah. No, I, 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 yeah. I, I, I feel always this like magic. I mean, some resurgence story or <laughs> all, yeah. Very unfortunately, I don't have an answer to it. I, I, I would like to know. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we usually say that, that, you know, you go to higher and higher order and then perturbative theory breaks down and then yeah. we reach some effective field theory regime. But I, but I don't know how it actually happens. And, and I think it's kind of important because people don't understand like uh, Higgs bosons, right? Uh, yeah. You have some X boson, heavy boson, and then you decays into very large number of X boson. And even if you do the Feynman diagram computation, it's the same computation. And then um, it, there, there is this explosion of the amplitude when you take the number of X boson to be large. I think people want to understand how, how you know, what, how to, how to like non perturbative -per resum everything to get. Something like this. I think it's hard. I, I, I don't know the answer to it. Yeah, but 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 uh, it's basically what I'm what I what I'm aiming for in the near future. Okay. Um, sorry, may I ask one more? So, sorry for yes, please, yes, please. sorry, Jongi. So, uh, yes, yes, yes. so um, this calculation reminds me of some Unjal's calculation for agent QCD. So mm -hmm. essentially similar. So S one. I mean, twisted boundary condition there, th then, then my, my question is, can you calculate entropy here at finite temperature? You know, my motivation is to see a card formula from this calculation, blah, blah, uh, yeah, signature yeah. of like or whatever, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. without supersymmetry of, If you just use effective field theory, I don't think it's going to be that interesting. So effective field theory, I think, captured the regime where chemical potential is much greater than uh, what a red beta. No, 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 no. Uh, much greater than the temperature. Uh, am I saying it correctly? Yes. Uh, I mean, okay. <laughs> Um, so, so, 
So, so basically, this effective field theory has only one ground state. And the entropy is zero. Even if you take, take into account the um, some finite, finite temperature, uh, so, so I think the spectrum looks like this. Uh, in the sector of a charge Q, you have ground state, and then you have order one excitations. And then you, you have like a gap of spirit of Q. Yeah, so, so, so okay, I, I guess one could do it. Uh, and that, but I'm not sure if we could see Cardi formula from it. Yeah, I, I think that's really, really interesting to do it too. For, for example, like, do we have a semi-classical solution that wind around S1 so that it kind of capture the entropy in the, you know, canonical ensemble? Yeah, th I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, yeah. O also, also like, what's the, what's the, Bulk jewel of this one, like, uh, could it correspond to black holes? But there is only one ground state, so mm -hmm. it doesn't look a lot like black holes. So, yeah, this is a question as well. I mean, it's sort of related. Because, to I think because you are you are considering the general temperature large beta limit here. Mm -hmm. hey. Again, as far as I understand, the reason is because you you are taking the large beta limit here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. So, right, so right. My question is: Can you consider the other upper limit, small beta limit, and mm. with the twisted boundary condition? Never done it actually. Yeah. I see. I see. Never done it, and I'm I'm far from an expert, so I can't say anything about useful right now. Yeah, but that's that's I, I think that's interesting, really really interesting. Yes. So do you, here don't you need like a large end or large central charge or something? It does uh, it or this effective field theory does not need large central charge or anything. Uh, it, it rather it's the opposite limit where much Q is much greater than N. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, when you say Cardi formula or black, yeah. formula, does it hold uh, without like a large N or? It, but for, but but I guess for example, two D fifty right? Uh, it, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be large. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure about 3D actually, but uh, 3D or 4D. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm... But, but but I guess there must be Cardi, Cardi formula for finite C or A, right, in 4D, because and no, I know I actually I actually don't know. P -p I think people people in Korea uh, write down Cardi formulas and then for like uh, 4D systems with. Various A and C, right? And then I I, I forgot the results, but uh... yeah, yeah. But in, anyway, this captured the regime where Q is much greater than N. So if we have to probe the regime N much greater than Q, if uh, uh, related or unrelated to Cardi formula, uh, we got to think about how these two regimes are connected. I mean, the famously you have BMN limit, right? Uh, which is like R charge much greater than one, but still much smaller than N, N or something, and root N or something. Maybe you can consider double scale limit, like a Q large and large, but the yeah. large or small. I think, yeah. I definitely think that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's the right way to go. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Okay, actually, my question was uh, this large M model, like uh, because uh, you are also in the Weissman and uh, probably also discussed uh, this large M metric, uh, large M vector model, and uh, yeah. uh, what large Q limit there. Like, uh, yeah, the that's, that's, implication yeah. to the highest spin gravity, or? Yes, 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 that would be very interesting. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, 
I, I still just know what happens to um, Q much greater than N in this case, you know, N squared maybe because it's matrix model. But yeah, I wish there was a way to do this one. Yeah, so for like, like I'm questioning, I'm asked, I'm specifically I asking that this vector model, like a UN vector model, and oh, you right. maybe consider you one charge or what? Yes, yes. Are there and uh, maybe if there what is the if there you can also put some large Q limit and they probably get some nice result and uh, I'm just a uh, wonder whether what is uh, the what can we learn from the that in the highest spin gravity so in high spin mm -hmm. gravity body that is also well discussed but uh, I'm not sure about the charge there so yeah. And uh, yeah, that was yeah one question. Yes. Um, the answer is that I haven't really heavily thought about it. Uh, yeah, but but I but I but I but I understand <laughs> understand what what you're saying. Yes. Okay. And, uh, my uh, another question is uh, you made uh, the effective action break the Laurent matter at least mm -hmm. like a. What is the uh, result in the end? Uh, what is uh, what that? What does it mean uh, in the O two model? Like uh, in the calculation, I mm -hmm. maybe I calculate recently, but uh, it seems that uh, I understand the procedure. But uh, what does it mean? What does it I, mean breaking symmetry? I I I think it just means that uh, so you have a potential. And fuel, you fill it up, fill it up with uh, chemical potential. Okay. Like uh, charge density, and this, you know, breaks the. So, so it's the same as placing a particle in the vacuum. Mm. Nice. You can you can see that this breaks the. Yeah, yeah. I see. Symmetry, but uh, yeah, right. If translational symmetry breaking. So small q limit, uh, this uh, uh, Lorentz symmetry is not broken because uh, it's a yeah, sort of, sort of. But uh, because uh, there are a lot of particles, so that may break the make a background and that uh, break the Lorentz symmetry. Yeah. And, and and I think I, I would say it's more like a preference of description. Uh -huh. uh, when when there are a small number of charges, it's advantageous to think about it. As like you have vacuum and you have excitation, mm -hmm. but when you have large number of them, not large number of them, it's ex ex uh, advantageous because it's like Bose and Einstein condensate. Eh? You know, B, C, and you have B, Bose and Einstein condensate eh, filling the space, so you can think about it as the new vacuum. So it's just a preference for what you how you want to describe physics. Okay, yeah, I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Any other question? Uh, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me stop the record.